Lifting up Jesus, opening his word from Australia, Denmark, Israel, Japan, New Zealand, Northern Ireland, Republic of Ireland, Singapore, South Africa, United Kingdom, Thailand, the Philippines, the United States, and throughout the world. You're watching L'Oreal TV. Uh, dear Brother Jacob, a uh, uh, scripture that has me confused is regarding the Lamb's Book of Life. In Revelation 13, 8, are our names written in the book as we come to believe in Jesus, the gospel, and are saved? Or are our names written in the book from before the creation of the world? If our names are written from before the creation of the world, then wouldn't that mean individual election is true? And that Ephesians chapter 1 is talking about individual election of believers? And would 2 Timothy 2 also mean that while Romans 9 is corporate, it can also be applied individually. Thank you so much for your question. It is a valid one. It highlights several different issues. First of all, the text of Romans 9, or Romans 9 to 11, is dealing with a very, very different subject than Revelation chapter 13. There's no direct correlation between the two or reason to interpret the one in light of the other, even though our overall interpretation looks at all scripture, there's no really direct connection between the two. One is talking about the election of nations. Revelation 13 is speaking about end time prophecy. Now this verse, before the foundation of the world, or written in the book of life, who, who had been slain, had been written from the foundation of the world. This relates to what Jesus told Nathaniel, as we've explained on several of our teaching. He saw him under the fig tree. When Nathaniel said, how did you know? The fig tree, the Eitzayim, being a metaphor for the tree of life. Jesus knew Nathaniel from the garden. He foreknew who was going to be saved. We must not confuse foreknowledge and divine omniscience with predestination. They are two different things. It was once explained by Chuck Missler uh, this way, and he did a pretty good job. When Chuck Missler sticks to scripture, he's actually a, quite a good teacher in many respects. He said it's like standing on top of a tall building watching a parade. The people on street level see the beginning of the parade, the middle of the parade, and the end of the parade. They don't know what's going to come next. Say as if you're watching the Rose Bowl in Pasadena, California or something like that. You see all these, these floats coming by. You don't know what's going to come next, what's going to be the finale at the end of the parade. But if you are on top of the building, you can see the beginning, the middle, and the end. Well, God's perspective is from eternity. He knows what's going to happen before it happens. But that does not determine or predetermine what the people marching in the parade are going to do. They're still marching. Foreknowledge, divine omniscience, is not the same thing as predestination. We hold the two in tension. The theological term for this is called an antimony. An antimony. Now, this was even a debate within Judaism. The Sadducees were determinists. The Pharisees said, all is foreseen, but the choice is given. Jesus agreed on this point with the Pharisees. He said concerning Judas, the Son of Man must be betrayed, but woe by whom he is betrayed. It would again be better for that man had he never been born or not been born. It did not negate Judas's personal responsibility. The Lord knows the end from the beginning. He's the Alpha and Omega. He's omniscient. He knows the future. He knows who's going to be saved, 
and he knew from the beginning of creation who would be saved and who would not. Nonetheless, that does not negate the responsibility of each individual, and it does not negate his willingness to save all. Well, just think of this. You can make an offer, say a parole board, made a generous offer to hard criminals, and they said to them, to a to, to, to hundred repeated convicts with recidivist rates, we're going to give you one more chance. If you remain committed to keeping the terms of parole, no further crime, no further association with known criminals, no involvement with drugs or gangs, personal financial responsibility, things of this nature, don't carry firearms and so forth. After 10 years, we're going to expunge your record as if it never happened. It'll remain in a secret file that's not accessible to the public. Without a court order, it's not even accessible to the police for future investigation. Great deal! Now, of these 100 guys, those prison guards, who they call hacks or screws, and those counselors and those parole officers, um, and those probation officers, and, 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 and those detectives, police detectives, who know about criminals, they're going to look at this 100 guys, and they're going to say, this guy is going to do it. This guy is going to do it. This guy is going to do it. She's going to do it. She's going to do it. The other 95 are going to be back in the joint. Give them six months. Give them a year. Give them two years max. They'll be back in here. And they'll largely be right. There may be the odd exception, but an experienced cop or an experienced prison officer or experienced parole officer or a criminologist is going to call it right the overwhelming statistical majority of the time based on experience and so forth. Nonetheless, they all co-equally have the same chance. It does not negate the fact they all have the same chance. But there's a kind of professional foreknowledge in the law enforcement community. Well, the difference being, God's foreknowledge is always right. <laughs> Statistically, the police, the parole authorities, whoever, probation board, whoever, they may make the occasional mistake. God doesn't make any mistakes. Do not confuse omniscience, foreknowledge, alpha and omega, knowing the end from the beginning from individual responsibility and a choice that God gives. I will draw all men unto me. Not everybody's going to be born again, but they're all going to have a chance to be. Chance to be saved. That's what it's speaking of in that context. Do not confuse the two things. Again, this becomes a philosophical issue more than a theological one. Calvinism, again, is based on humanism. A, a Christianized humanism, but it's based on humanism. Remember, Calvinistic thought is largely philosophical. It is not theological. Remember also that Calvinism is philosophically Islamic, not Judeo-Christian. In Islam, it is called Inja Allah. Everything that happens is God's perfect will in Islamic belief. Well, in Scripture, everything that happens is not God's perfect will. God, speaking in the first person through Jeremiah, saw the Babylonian captivity coming. And up to the last moment, he was pleading with, with Judah through Jeremiah. Up to the last moment, he was pleading with backslidden Israel through Amos and Hosea, repent, 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 so this won't happen. Now, we knew it was going to happen. Isaiah predicted it before Jeremiah. 
Joel predicted it before Jeremiah. But that does not negate God giving the nation the chance. Well, call the Homer. God does not want it to happen. But he pretty well knows who's going to believe and who won't. Who will remain faithful and who will not. It's important to remember it's only by his grace. He must sustain us. But he does give us a choice. Thank you for your question. My name is Jacob Prash. God bless. Blessings, dear friends. Greetings of Jesus. This is your friend Jacob Prash speaking to you at the moment from the UK. You know, so many of the questions we get in our Roku broadcast and on our Vimeo clips and on YouTube deal with subjects that we deal with much more extensively in our books. We can't, for the sake of brevity, uh, go into the kind of depth in a TV broadcast we can actually go into in a book. But so many of the questions come from material that are expounded in the books on a much more broader scale that it's almost frustrating sometimes that we can't spend hours and hours answering a, a, the questions that, that are given to us. Obviously, practicality dictates that's not a possibility. The books are there. They're available. They're available in print through the Moriel catalog on the Moriel website, moriel.org. But in this day of Kindle and electronic books, they're also available through Amazon and they're available through Kindle. Kindle. The three books that would be the most referred to in the questions we receive are the three latest books. The first being The Dilemma of Laodicea. The Dilemma of Laodicea is an exposition of the seven churches in Revelation, culminating with the final two churches, Philadelphia and Laodicea particularly, setting the stage for the return of Jesus. The Dilemma of Laodicea would be the first. The second would be Shadows of the Beast. Shadows of the Beast. How the coming Antichrist, how his identity will be revealed to the faithful church. The rapture will not happen, will not happen, absolutely not happen, until the faithful church knows who the ultimate beast of revelation is. That is the Antichrist and also the false prophet. How the identity of the coming Antichrist will be revealed to the faithful church Shadows of the Beast, the second book. And the final and latest one, Harpezo, Harpezo, what the scripture actually teaches about the rapture, the snatching away which takes place between the sixth and seventh seals in the book of Revelation. So these three books, The Blum of Laodicea, Shadows of the Beast, and Harpezo, all available on the Morio catalog, all available through Amazon, and all easily available electronically by Kendall. Thank you so much, dear friends. God bless, and Jesus be with you.